It is just a huge honor to start the new year, 2019, my first podcast of the year with Dr. Dan Groba. Thank you so much. You and he is a legend in Arizona. He, Dr. Dan Grove at Scottsdale Orthodontic Care in Scottsdale, Arizona, after selling his successful practice over 25 years to two orthodontists in Tucson, Arizona, he decided to move with his wife, Nancy, and join his ASU educated children in Scottsdale, Arizona. Prior to his move to Arizona, he and his wife of 30 years were residents of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where they grew up uh, within one mile of each other. Uh, Marquette University is where he received all of his dental, orthodontic, and prosthodontic education, and he was honor honored with numerous awards upon graduation. This included the OKU Honorary Dental Fraternity, as well as the ASN Honorary Jesuit Fraternity. He received the American Society of Dentistry for Children Senior Student Dental Award for his exemplary work with young patients. During the past five years, he has been fortunate to accomplish practically everything a successful professional uh, would desire, including president of the Southern Arizona Dental Society, directing the cleft lip and palate clinic at Tucson Medical Center, instructor of histology and embryology at Pima Community College, assistant professor of prosthodontics at the Marquette University School of Dentistry, clinical instructor of orthodontics at the Marquette University School of Dentistry, member of the Invisalign Speaker Bureau, being asked to publish in the prestigious American Journal of Orthodontics and Dental Facial Orthopedics was an honor following his presentation of treated patients to the American Board of Orthodontics, where he was certified as a diplomat. Dr. Grove also was published in the Dental Clinics of North America, as well as Orthotown Magazine. You've been the director of Orthotown Magazine four years as it'll, of today. It'll be four years as of today. Four that's years, correct. and I yeah. thank, well, you thank you so much thank you. for that's four what, years of your life. And that's what kind of started my, my career up here in the Phoenix area. That's great. Really? That's what's right? Yeah. So in addition, Dr. Grove has been named top doctor in Tucson for the past several years, including 2014 when he moved to Scottsdale. And that same issue, I was voted bottom doctor. <laughs> so we have the top and the bottom at one time. Uh, but I, I wanted to start the year with you because um, we've both been doing this for three decades. Um, my office is 31 years old. And I, I look back when I got out of school there hasn't been really radical changes in most of the nine specialties. I mean, the only controversy I see in pediatric dentistry is silver diamine fluoride. You either love it or hate it. Um, endodontists, I, I don't really, if I had dinner with five endodontists, they're not really, there's usually really no big issues that are earth shaking. But 30 years ago, periodontal was the most turned upside down because of implants and okay. shifting from quadrant perio surgery, and then you had the early doctors saying treat it with extractions and implants, and now you're seeing the shift back as you start seeing that after five years, 40% of these implants have peri-implantitis and all these periodontists saying, gosh, I wish I would have kept the molar and did, you know, so you should have, but your profession, orthodontics, just completely has the most change. Invisalign, Smiles Direct Club, um, even yesterday, to throw insult into injury, I know you probably saw this, but um, the German government uh, posted a, uh, did you see that about that, uh, they find no uh, need, and let, me, let me see, um, I'll get it right here. I'll be real honest, I didn't hear what the German okay, government Okay, well anyway, said the yesterday. German government, of course, <laughs> they're, they're the ones paying for the war, yes. though, but they, um, they published an article, it was in um, uh, No Proof Dental Braces Work, German government report finds the study reached the damning conclusion that there was no evidence to black claims that braces provide long-term dental benefits. I mean, I'm sure you could say the same thing about, I mean, uh, you know, so, so many things. Um, but so anyway, so thanks for starting off the new year because I wanted to get to the most controversial topics, Invisalign, Smiles Direct Club, and the German government. Now, you know the German government saying that because they're, they're paying a billion dollars a month in ortho claims. Right. So, so they're sitting back saying, well, we don't see that Susie lives longer or lasts longer. You know, we, we, we don't see that this is a health benefit. So now Germany wants to quit paying it. So what, what, what controversies? Well, I, I think we can, we, like we, can, we can address that topic by, by reflecting on the previous discussion we had about the Polish government pulling out of dental care in Poland and you offering uh, a sum of money to a number of the Polish dentists to have a front tooth removed and none of them would take the money. Uh, the beauty about orthodontics is that the government can tell us all day long that straight teeth isn't going to provide a health benefit and yet they'll still be beating a path to the door to have their teeth straightened. 
uh, as evidenced by Smile Direct Club and Invisalign. And, and yes, those are disruptors in the way we provide services. I don't really think it's disrupted the profession of orthodontics in, this, in the sense of we still do orthodontics to straighten teeth. We still try to do the best job we can. We, we solve uh, issues of growth and or we don't solve issues of growth and development, but we're, uh, we work with growth and development to provide a healthy individual as they go from youth to adulthood. So uh, the, the controversial topics that you bring up are more delivery of care rather than the specialty of orthodontics. Uh, orthodontics is still uh, growth, development, uh, cooperation. Uh, the pendulum has swung from non-extraction to extraction probably a couple of times in, in my career. You know, you and I each have three decades of, you know, 30, 35 years of practice. And uh, I can still remember uh, my program director, you know, talking about the need to remove teeth. Then we went through the uh, need to not remove teeth. And uh, now uh, we're doing a lot more early treatment. Uh, people were beating um, down the doors to get into orthodontic practices and orthodontists found it was easier to just do one phase treatment uh, and we really didn't know the benefits of early phase treatment. Uh, we, we said, well, you can just wait until all your teeth come in crooked, we'll put braces on, I can finish you in 14 months. Well, I live in Scottsdale and practice in Scottsdale and I can tell you that I can tell all of my seven, eight, nine year old uh, patients whose mothers bring their, their kid in with the first crooked tooth and say, Oh, just come back when they're all nasty crooked and they look like a, uh, a jack-o'-lantern and we'll straighten you in 12 months because I've got the best brace that'll take care of that. So people demand care. And uh, I think orthodontists have been uh, reacting to that. And yes, Invisalign and, uh, and Smile Direct Club have really turned the, the business side of orthodontics upside down. Uh, and it's, it's basically a different way to do the same thing. Uh, when I gave a lecture at Marquette, uh, we had our 55-year uh, anniversary of the program, and uh, I was asked to give uh, kind of a reflective uh, lecture on my experience with Invisalign, and I showed patient number one, and I showed my most recent patient. And uh, what, what I tried to leave the audience with is, we use cosmetic appliances, whether they be, be clear braces, or we use cosmetic appliances, whether it, or, and it might be plastic, but we're still doing the same thing. So we, we bend the plastic to move the teeth, or we bend the arch wire to move the teeth, and uh, the arch wire anchors to the teeth with clear braces. So we're still doing the same thing, uh, and, it's, and it's upset everyone because we had to learn a whole new technique. And I can tell you after 15 or 20 years of doing Invisalign, I, I feel finally that I'm getting comfortable at tackling virtually any any project with uh, clear aligner therapy. What percent of your cases can you do with Invisalign? Boy, the, I gotta say three quarters, eighty percent probably. I mean, I, I mean, we've got uh, in the in the lecture that I delivered, uh, I had class one, class two, division one, class two, division two, class three. Uh, there are. Uh, some of the Invisalign studs out there that are doing uh, surgical cases with Invisalign. So I don't think there are many cases that can't be handled with Invisalign. And uh, the technology, the techniques are there. Sometimes I'll start off a case with uh, uh, a, a fixed appliance, maybe on the palate or in the buckle segments, like a carrier appliance or something like that to, uh, to get some of the mass movement done. But the vast majority of patients can be treated with Invisalign. So, I um, mean, let's, this is dentistry and sensor. I don't want to talk about anything everybody mm -hmm. wants to talk about. Um, so Invisalign is now opened up their first store. Yes. In um, Scottsdale Fashion Center. Yes. Right? Is, that, is that in Scottsdale? Yes. And for those who don't know, he lives in the very rich part of town and I live in the poverty Phoenix area. Where you, <laughs> did you have, did you pack a gun when you drove down? No, 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 um, but it's the only store, right, in Arizona, Invisalign, just in... It, it's, it's the only Invisalign branded yeah. store. I believe there is a, a, like a scanning store in the Chandler Mall that... that that's owned by Invisalign? No, that's what I said. It's, it's, that's, it's, that, that's owned by someone else. Smiles directly? No, I don't even know if it's owned by oh. them. But, but the, the question I was going is, do orthodontists... Um, what, what is their relationship with Invisalign? Is it love? Is it hate? Is it, 
Is it just competition? Um, do, what, does that store? Well, if you're in Scottsdale and they have a store in Scottsdale, do you feel like now the company you're using is competing against you? How, how does that work? Well, the, the, work? the way those stores work is that they they branded themselves, and I think quite honestly, they're in the middle of redefining themselves. And then they're offered a couple of different options. Do you want your teeth a little bit straight? Uh, average straight or deluxe straight. I disagree totally with that concept uh, and I'll explain why in a second but basically it's a referral service. The, uh, the, the, the guns from uh, Invisalign had visited my office and basically said this is the, the business model that we're, we're providing and we see ourselves as we go forward as becoming a like a referral source for orthodontists. We have had a couple of patients call from that store. Both of them haven't, can haven't scheduled, they've canceled or rescheduled. So I don't know what the success will be. Uh, the thing that I find really interesting is for the first 10 to 15 years of Invisalign's existence, they spent tons and tons of uh, time and money educating doctors and proving to themselves as well as people like myself that Invisalign can do the most complex cases to fixed bracket therapy standards and now they've turned themselves around and said okay patient you come in and you tell us what you want done and we'll we'll treat to your standard so i quite honestly i think they're they, they kind of made a mistake I, I i think i think a lot of us that have educated ourselves to work with clear aligners have figured out how to do it in a really productive and effective manner and can deliver just the finest care and now because of Smile Direct Club, they, they feel they have to react to the mass market. Uh, Does Invisalign still own 19%? I understand that they've divested themselves of that and that some other manufacturer is, is doing the uh, manufacturing for Smile Direct Club because of the conflicts. Uh, okay. Smile Direct Club is, is becoming pretty successful with their you know, let the patient decide. I mean, and we can go on here and, you know, there's there's postings on Facebook and my daughter has stories of her hairdresser that's going back and forth. And, and there, there's all kinds of, you know, tragic stories from Smile Direct Club. The, the fact of the matter is, as you know, in dentistry, there's, there's patients that are disappointed after they visit an orthodontist also. So uh, in, in the world of dentistry, Howard, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. When, when a big trend takes, takes hold, it takes, would you say, five to 10 years for the population to kind of sift through what they've been told and then get back to reality. And then once again, dentistry is on a path to prosperity and, and uh, the way it used to be done. There's, there's always changes. There's new technology. There's new material. But for the most part, we're fixing teeth. And in orthodontics, for the most part, we're making them look nice. Um, I think the biggest thing in our profession right now is... Um, at least for me as an old guy, uh, is what cone beam technology has done as far as allowing us to look at patients in terms of volumes rather than uh, panorexes and seps and photos. Um, I like that word, you use volumes. Well, it's not... I said a 3D, I, you I, said volumes. I, 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 I didn't coin it. I mean, that's uh, Sean Carlson out of uh, San Francisco is, is pretty much leading the... the, the the trend in that and, and says I, I we know. podcast interviewed him I, I, I podcast interviewed him as a warm up yeah video. well <laughs> Sean Sean in his practice uh, and Sean is an educator and a researcher San and Fran area yes and as you know he's uh, he's starting a company <coughs> Orthoscience which basically is, is working to document digitally everything that every orthodontist is doing in, in the world uh, so that we can all you know gain knowledge from that uh, but Looking at patients in terms of volumes and air spaces and airway um, is a whole different way of approaching orthodontics. And I think over the next 10, 15 years, you're going to see that take hold. Um, one of the things I can't get my hands around is the concept of um, the legal about, um, what, what do they call that? The, um, the standard of care. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems like it's different for all 50 states, uh, it seems, um, but is a CBCT approaching the standard of care for an orthodontic workup or is that a far stretch? I think that's probably still a stretch at this point. Uh, I just think that you can, you can solve other issues with CBCT. And I can still practice without a, I mean, I, I can find some pathology with a CBCT. Uh, 
for me, it helps me do my job better and, and approach um, growth and development better. But you can still uh, practice good orthodontics with a pan, Ceph, and photos, uh, following the AAO guidelines, which is kind of a uh, kind of a nebulous uh, contract or, or a nebulous uh, paper that talks about how you should have X-rays and photographs and these things. Uh, it, it depends upon what. Uh, what the orthodontist is trying to achieve and what, and what he's presenting to patients. Like I said, orthodontics is, is largely an elective business. Uh, I love it when, when uh, parents come in or when the, the, typically the father brings the child and you know he's looking to pick a fight because uh, he wants me to say that his daughter needs braces and I, as soon as the father is sitting in the chair, I say, well, as we all know, orthodontics is a highly elective uh, business and uh, if you're happy with the way your daughter appears right now, we, you know, we can end the discussion. If you'd like to go on, we can talk some more. And typically he'll fall back in the chair and let us take over and we'll have spacers in the patient by the end of the appointment. So uh, it, it's, the, it's the beauty of the profession. Uh, Russ Kittleson, my mentor in, uh, uh, in Marquette, uh, basically said, you know, as, as long as people can smile and see themselves in the mirror and they see the gap in the, in the tooth or they see protrusion, they'll still want orthodontic care. And uh, I don't ever have to spend a lot of time on, you know, their bite this or their bite that or your bite is off or your bite is on. The fact of the matter is everybody bites, you know, and, and you can go to a third world country and everybody's doing fine in the streets with crooked teeth. And so I just go, I, I can make this a lot better, you know. Dan, I grew up in um, Kansas, mm -hmm. so my, both of my grandparents were in Parsons, Kansas, so uh, my um, dad's family, big, but I, I had uncles that had zero teeth and would sit there and eat almonds. That's right. And when I was in dental school, I was there one time with one of my uncles and I said, um, do you care if I hold up your lip and see you eat almond? And their ridges are completely calloused and they would crunch almonds like, like they were getting hit by hammers. So, so, so um, I think there's plenty of evidence that edentulous people, and they were obese. Right. So they're edentulous and they can eat so well, they're, you know, I call fat feature meals already taken. And they were all carrying 50 mils of pre-chewed stored food. Um, is there, um, is there very good um, alternatives to Invisalign and clear, and clear aligners? That are there, there, there are new, you know, uh, I know Henry Schein, 3M. So uh, I, Great Lakes. I, I There's it, probably a half a dozen other companies that are now uh, manufacturing aligners. Plus, big practices are buying their own uh, their own software. You can actually get software online for free that'll do basic alignment. Uh, they buy a 3D printer and they suck down splints and they're making their own. So, so some of the larger practices and some other boutique practices, they're just making their own in-house aligners, and it can be done. Because of the Invisalign lab bill, that, that's a significant. Yeah, it's, it's it's a big cost. Yeah, and and, and that's and that's a tough one. I, I mean, I, uh, you know, when when I when when I look at my practice and I you know and I look at the the percentages spent on labs and things, uh, it, it's it's definitely uh, a business consideration, and I've written about it in Orthotown where, the the modern orthodontic practice is not you know ten chairs lined up. Well, there, there are practices like that. I I take that back. But I guess what I'm saying is that um, the, the modern orthodontic practice can function with fewer staff people in different positions. In other words, you certainly need a digital assistant. The skill set for the modern orthodontic assistant is, is very different. I mean, they Did have- Did you even have a computer in dental school? Uh, no, I, I didn't. Did I? And, I, and I did my, my, my master's thesis using uh, those IBM punch cards that were run through a, right. like a, a, a card reader. I told, my, I told my four boys there on New Year's Eve, you know, I said, trust me, you know, you're 21, no, they're 23, 25, 21, 23, 25, 20. And I said, you know, when you're a grandpa, a third of the economy will be with stuff that's not even invented yet. Right. I mean, I never saw any of this stuff coming. Well, my, my day yesterday, I, I mean, I, I worked Saturday morning on patients, uh, which we do once a month, but I went back to the office, you know, Sunday, and I had to do eight clean checks on, on Invisalign. I mean, basically, you, you, you bring up the, uh, the, the patient folder, you, you double check the work that the technicians have done in Costa Rica, and you, uh, 
and, and you change things and you make it the way you want and uh, th this is what I've this is what I've learned to do and, and now I'm starting to enjoy it at first it was uh, it, Invisalign is kind of funny because when it came out they had technicians and you would write a note and say dear technician please do this and it would come back it was done very well uh, at one point I had my own technician now they've gone to, to teams of technicians uh, so so in the beginning when ClinCheck software came out, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could do that ourselves? And then, of course, we got spoiled because they were doing it for us. And then they got big and their technicians weren't as well skilled. And they said, well, you've got to do it yourself. And I was spoiled. And I said, well, I don't want to do it myself anymore. Um, but that was my first idea. I thought, gee, I should be able to do that. Well, now we're back to the, the I'm pretty sure that the, the listeners will agree that if you want to deliver high, high level clear a line of therapy. You have to get in there and, and bend the wire yourself or have your technician do it to your standards. Uh, you have to have uh, preferences organized in your software for uploading saying, okay, I have a class two division one patient. Uh, I want you to do this first and basically have detailed instructions. And then we copy and paste those various instructions. So we have, we have instructions for class one, class two, uh, for anterior cross bites. And uh, my digital assistant copies and pastes the, uh, the little Word document into my prescript clinical prescription, and then we upload it to Invisalign, and it just saves time. What, per, what macroeconomic numbers are you hearing? Like, what percent of the 325 million Americans do you think have had ortho? What, what percent? Oh, gosh, have had ortho? Or, yeah, in their lifetime. Boy, I really am I'm not. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing 5%. Yeah. And I really got religion on um, the power of orthodontics. Um, well, I was doing a lecture one time. It was, uh, I took three of my four boys. It was uh, South Africa, Cambodia, um, Malaysia, and I think Hong Kong, Japan. But when I was in Cambodia and Malaysia, I mean, we were having dinner one night and the waitress was talking to those boys and she, she figured out I was a dentist. Immediately goes to Invisalign. And so long story short, I started asking people about uh, straightening their teeth and the brand name of Invisalign was gold in these underdeveloped or you know developing countries like Cambodia where the they're very poor. And this, this lady, this girl, very young, beautiful, she's probably low 20s and was spending 1250 US when she has an annual income of about 5000 US and I was asking her why she was getting Invisalign and when I, I started doing the math and then I, I cross over with other things like uh, there are very many communities in Asia where women will spend 40% of their income on health and beauty makeup this yes. that and this girl who no, no boy in Cambodia would say she wasn't beautiful and she's spending one thousand of her five thousand dollar annual income because this one's a little crowded and this one's a little, and then and then i see that um i believe um when uh joe hogan the ceo of the line turned on i think he was on um oh cnbc who's that bald guy on? yeah kramer kramer and uh what a handsome man <laughs> and um he um was saying that only five percent of americans have ever had ortho so the upside for ortho, for in my opinion, the upside for ortho for the next century is going to be mammoth. I, I, I could easily see countries as they get richer and richer and richer go from five percent of the population having ortho to maybe. A well, quarter. I think I think straight teeth and a nice you know the power of a smile. Like I said, we we're going back to your discussion from your Polish experience. Uh, I, I I think having straight teeth is one of the first things developing countries can do to kind of westernize their their appearance. I mean, it might have been blue jeans in years past or whatever, but now if they can uh, uh, show that they're actually taking care of their body with a nice smile, um, that's a tremendous benefit. Well, what he's referenced on the Polish experience is, um, it was back in 89, I think it was December of 89, the Berlin Wall fell. And my buddies in Poland were all upset because the government used to pay for all dental. They went to a dental government, they did it, and they said, oh, you don't understand communism, Howard, you're an American. These people have been taken care of cradle to grave, 
and they're all they're, they're never going to spend their own money on their teeth. And I said, well, that's based on the assumption that Polish people aren't the same types of humans as America's melting pot. I said, that, that's crazy. I don't believe it for a second. So I went down there to lecture, and every time a Polish dentist uh, would tell me that the, and, and back in 89 and 90 that the, the Polish would never spend money on their teeth, I'd say, okay, well, I'll give you $1,000, and I'd pull out 10 $100 bills if I can extract your front tooth. And these women Polish dentists were like, no way, no way, no way. And it reminded me of the, um, you know, what we learned in MBA school with healthcare is the little blue pill. And the little blue pill, you know, humans, they say one thing, they do another. Um, they, the government, people always say we spend too much money on healthcare. Well, that's not what I hear on the people because the people, if I go up to a person and they tell me their five-year-old child is going to die of a disease and I say, well, I have a little blue pill. If I give you this little blue pill and your child takes it, it won't die. But it's going to cost you. You have to give me your house, your car, your phone, your computer, your TV. You're going to have to give me everything. And what percent of the moms say, take it all? They all say it. They, they, all, say they it. all say it, sure. And I say, well, that's funny because the government never says we spend too much money on housing and cars and phones and computers. But I've never met a mother or a father that wouldn't go... Completely to live under a, 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 a bridge in a box to save their child from dying from a disease that they could buy a little blue pill. So I said, you know, the Polish women want whiter, brighter, straighter teeth as much as the women in Cambodia or New York. I mean, they just beauty is huge. And they just want to be beautiful. And, and there's, and, and I, I talked about the fact that orthodontics is highly elective and and back to CBCT and, and the importance of volume imaging and things like that. We, we are seriously learning a lot more about airway and, and breathing and, and uh, removing teeth versus not removing teeth. This discussion comes up in the message boards in, uh, in Orthotown all the time, you know, where uh, cases are posted and which teeth should I take out? And I'll respond sometimes and say, well, wait, wait a minute, why, why did we jump to which teeth are we taking out? Why, why don't we look beyond that and say, maybe, perhaps there's some muscle habits and myofunctional issues and airway issues and things. And uh, th there, th there's, there's a, um, a difference in the way that topic is being approached in various programs across the country. So there are, you know, we are kind of in, in a crossroads now between those that are latching on to that concept and those that are still stuck in the you know, measure tooth size discrepancy and overbite and overjet and curvacy and um, you know, you're, you're diagnosing a 12 or 14 year old and deciding what that, that 12 or 14 year old is supposed to look like, not realizing that the smile on the face ages into age 45 and the lips hang and they don't show as much incisor and, the, and they might be breathing differently or they had a mouth habit. So I'm, I'm a big uh, mouth habit kind of guy. You know, I, I mean, I believe that uh, we, we as orthodontists are in business because of mouth habits, clenching, grinding, thumb sucking, nail biting, uh, oral facial issues, breathing habits, all that kind of stuff. There was a big controversy um, on the message boards um, uh, where, let me, um, it was a very famous rapper, uh, rapper um, Bod Baby, B-H-A-D-B-H-A-B-I-E, and she spent $40,000 on veneers, and she's 15. And the dentist on Dentaltown and, uh, had an uproar because they thought, 15, you're not old enough to have your teeth filed down for veneers. She should have had braces and bleaching. Um, now, when you and I were little and got out of school, they were always filing down crooked teeth. The cosmetic dentists, the mm -hmm. biggest names in cosmetic dentistry, lectured all the conventions. Were, and it, it made me cringe. I mean, I was a young baby and they were sticking all the teeth in pencil sharpeners and putting PFMs. And you thought, what is that going to look like in 10 years? They'd always say, oh, my crowns never failed. Yeah, like, right. yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't believe that. Where do you, um, so, so the transition's gone from sticking every anterior tooth into a pencil sharpener to doing ortho bleaching bonding. So I want to ask you specifically about this case, 15. Do you think 15 year olds can make a decision to file all their teeth down for veneers, or do you think that should have been bleaching? Well, that's well, that's that the pro price of being a rapper. I'm sure that that decision was made in conjunction with with a business coach and parents and all kinds of things, and 
Uh, they probably said, well, if we take the time out of your life for a year or a year and a half to put you through orthodontics, uh, it's going to cut, cut into your income or your tour or whatever. So I don't know that that's uh, actually the, the answer. But here, here's, here's a good thing that I hear a lot is I have an awful lot of parents bring their child in with missing lateral incisors. And uh, a Which lot of genetic? Genetic missing lateral incisors. And of course, uh, sometimes the dentist says, well, we just want to close all the spaces, as if that has no long-term consequence. And um, the parents ask, well, what should we do? And I say, well, I'll tell you what, what's usually done. Parents come in with their, their kid, and they say, I want you to close the spaces, because they're just thinking it's going to cost $5,000 a tooth for implants. And I say, and sometimes we can do that. I said, but I've had any number of patients come back at age 25, 35, and 45 and say, can you open up those spaces again? So, um, you know, the best dentistry, and I, I don't know if this is the, the proper form to say this, but probably the, the best dentistry, all things being equal, would be none. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, but, uh, and, and I was, that was taught to me by my prosthodontic mentor. He said, you know, the best dentistry is none. Uh, unfortunately, be, because of mouth habits and things, orthodontics becomes like a necessity in, in the developed world. And there's any number of patients that I'm seeing for the second and third time on orthodontics. And sometimes it's the orthodontist says, well, I can do it better than the last guy. He does the same damn thing and nothing really changes. But you have to kind of take a step back and say, okay, so why did the, I mean, I, I, I try to give the first guy the benefit of the doubt and say, I'm sure he or she did the best job he or she could do. And now, now we're left with this. Why, why did it end up like this? You know, is it aging? Is it habit? Is it uh, degeneration of the temporomandibular joint? Um, I got started with Orthotown with, with my, uh, my legendary article, I'm going to call it that just because I get to, uh, Treatment by Twelves, which said, you know, in, in orthodontics, you're dealing with the first 12 teeth that come in, which is four upper and lower incisors and the four, mol four molars. And then you deal with the side teeth, which is the cuspids and the first and second bias, so that's the next 12, and then you deal with the 12 year molar. So I break orthodontics into you know, three different time periods, you know, age six to nine, 10 to 14, and 14 and above. And, and during those periods of time, you have to always look at the same thing. Which, which teeth are, are in the mouth? How are the jaws forming? How's the joint working? And are there habits, uh, breathing habits or, or muscular habits or, or things like that? And at, I, I swear, every time in those three periods, you're always going to be reacting to those four influences on the dentition. And uh, if, you, if you look at relapse, or if you look at stable cases, it's because stable cases are because those factors are under control, and relapses are because one of those factors overpowered the other. Degeneration of the joint, uh, oral facial muscular issues, uh, jaw problems that weren't addressed, or teeth that didn't erupt, or teeth that drift because of missing teeth. I can't tell you how many parents, or how many uh, adults come in with missing posterior teeth, uh, with flared upper teeth and spaces, and they want, they want that fixed. I said, well, we gotta kind of build up the back so that it's stable. Well, I don't wanna, you know, yeah, my dentist keeps telling me that, that I need that, a tooth implanted or whatever, but I just want my front teeth straight. I said, well, you got an unstable situation. Teeth are drifting, shifting, and all that kind of stuff. You'll be back again in five years. So it's education. I mean, you've seen it for. So the missing tooth is genetic, the lateral. Oh yeah. You see that running family. Oh yes, totally, yeah. totally. I mean, I never had a missing lateral, but I had a genetic brain deal. Um, when I was born, the left half of my brain wasn't right, <laughs> and the right half yeah. there was nothing left. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Um, so we we talked about the Invisalign story here. Yes. Um, now Smiles Direct. If if I go to my iPhone, put yeah. the Smiles Direct on it. There, there's five centers. Yes. So so we're let's talk about them for a little. Where, where are they? Where well, are they? because here, here's because, a good story. Because Saturday, my first exam was a 35 year old guy who came in with an anterior crossbite and spacing, and uh, we, we did an Invisalign workup for him, and he took a proposal away. And my assistant came up to me afterwards and said, just so you know, he married so-and-so who came in for an Invisalign consult six months ago, or even longer ago, and she ended up doing Smile Direct Club. So I'm sure he's going to do the same thing. So it, it's, it's impacting us. Um, I, I, can't get, I, I can't fall on my sword over it. I mean, it's out there. When, when I look back at it, I go, okay. So 
you know, there, there's an adult with, and he had had orthodontics in the past. He had some orthodontic relapse. Uh, spacing and, and Smile Direct Club will probably solve his immediate need. Uh, and life goes on. I, I guess, I, I guess my, my attitude is, I think it's almost up to dentistry to decide, does the, does the dental board have regulatory authority over orthodontics? Uh, I've, I've for years said that orthodontics should be its own specialty and that we should have an obligation to refer our orthodontic patients to dentists and dentists should have their uh, responsibility to refer to orthodontists and if you think about it, we'd both be busier. But uh, instead, we've gotten into this turf war over the years. Uh, if, if orthodontics would have started off as its own regulatory board years ago, rather than you know, you know, sucking up to the ADA or whatever, and you know, we have to be nice to them, or they won't be nice to us, or my, my, but my, my good referring dentist won't send me anybody. Well, if, if we were our own thing, we would be our own thing. But it's, I mean, you're never supposed to talk about um, religion, politics, sex, or violence. And I, I, I try very hard to avoid yeah. all those, but some, some things you have to... It, it seems like in my 56 years, um, the, the, the best way to understand this grasp of America and other countries in the healthcare system is go back to the uh, 1984 book, the, uh, the Rise and Fall of the Healthcare uh, by Paul Starr. Did you ever read that book? I did. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, uh, what, what is the best book of the year called? You get the Pulitzer Prize winning okay. book. It was the, I, in fact, I went back and read it again in like 2000. It's such a documentary. But basically, the, we're all, because right now, you, where America, if you study it, it's last hundred years, you see where you can really advise to healthcare and other developing countries where it's going to go to. But it started out in 1900 where there was no regulation and everybody was just riding around curing everything with lotions and potions. Right. They usually all had the same thing. Alcohol, cocaine, heroin, you know, they were all, and then they would ride into town and no matter what disease you had, you needed the same potion. And it was about 1900 where uh, the government finally said, this is crazy. So they, they rolled out the deal, the, the state boards, and they made them the judge, the jury, and the executioner. So they, they said the boards will, um, um, license the school, the med schools and dental schools, and when you come out of that, um, to, they will to get your license to the state. And so they were the judge jury, and you can't sue the board. If, if you go to the board and you don't like them, you can't get an attorney and appeal it. You can't appeal it to anyone. So they're the judge jury and executioner. So that, so in that one like five year period, like ninety percent of all the med schools and doctors were unlicensed. They said you're you're not you know yeah. I so then you started, the, and, and, that, and at that time, healthcare was 1% of the GDP. And a century after that decision, it was 14% the right. GDP. It was the largest rise of any economic sector. If you think um, Henry Ford's car was a big deal, you haven't studied healthcare. It was the biggest deal. But now, listening to the comments, um, for instance, remember it was in Tennessee, where Smiles Direct Club from, where there was a lawsuit that said that, well, the mall can't bleach teeth. And the, the local board um, sued them and said, shut down. And it went to the court. And the court said, well, you're a cartel. You're just protecting your members. This is competition. And then I listened to all the, um, the, the very few senators that we have, I think, five. There's never been a president that's a dentist or a senator that's a dentist or a Supreme Court dentist. But um, there's five in Congress. But... You you, um, you listen to the other congressmen, and and they're using the term that these regulatory agencies are cartels to protect their customers, and then um, so um, the Smiles Drug Club, um, you know, when it started coming out, a lot of dentists were saying, well, they legally can't do that, and and but I haven't seen any legal challenges to stop them. And then there was the big Texas thing last year, which was an earthquake, where a guy was an implantologist saying he specialized in implantology. And the local boards all said, well, you, there, there's only nine specialties recognized by the ADA. And it goes to the court, and the court says, the ADA is a membership organization. Right. You're not a regulatory agency. And they ask this guy, or, do you only do implants? And he says, yeah, that's all I do. He says, well, you're not lying, and you guys are a club. So it looks like, to me, the last century of going from zero regulation to the strict boards 
is now going to swing back well, Mike, to deregulation over the next this is several this, generations. This is a timely topic because the column, the, the first column that I'm introducing in the January February issue of Orthotown talks about uh, how we have to look at the institutions that have guided us all these years. Uh, my, my daughter is a classic example. She's a millennial who has worked for Uber Corporate, she's worked for GoDaddy, and now she works for Homelight.com. All three of those are uh, internet-based. Uh, Uber, GoDaddy, and who? And uh, Homelight.com. Homelight? Homelight. And what's that? And it, it's, it's like Uber for real estate agents. In other words, you type in your requirements to Homelight.com, they find you a broker, who is, whose commission is cut by 25% and they use their artificial intelligence to find you the best broker to find a, uh, in your neighborhood with your requirements. Uh, so I, I kind of document her work history and I say, boy, this, the, the millennial generation is used to disruptive technology. So to tell a millennial generation that old time technology like dentistry and the boards and everything is the way it's gotta be isn't gonna fly. So I think what we're gonna have to see or what we will see is that the old institutions like four-year dental education, you know, maybe we'll go back to preceptorships or whatever, or apprenticeships in, in uh, orthodontics. You know, Edward Engel, I think, uh, started his own school or tweet or something. I get him kind of mixed up, but, uh, but I mean, there He's was- the father of orthodontics. Right, I mean, Engel was, but, but I mean, there was a time where if you wanted to be an orthodontist, you, you latched on to a seasoned orthodontist, followed him around in the office for a while, you came out and you were an orthodontist. So now we, we, we convince, generations that they have to borrow hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a quote unquote degree in orthodontics. Meanwhile, patients are you know, taking uh, iPhone photos of their teeth and probably be scanning them with their iPhone soon and getting their, their teeth straight. So my, my point in the column is going to be that I think we're gonna have to look uh, at the institutions of education and regulation a little differently because it's gonna be changing. So you and I live in the Phoenix Valley, which has two dental schools, one AT Still in Mesa, right. one Midwestern Glendale. Um, what do you think of their orthodontic education? I mean, they're, they're dropping a hundred grand a year. So they paid $400,000, and most of them are coming out about that many student loans. What letter grade would you give them on their orthodontic education when they graduate? Well, the, the, the orthodontic specialty program at AT Still is almost second to none at this point. Dr. Dr. Park is, has been elevated to the Board of Orthodontics. Uh, that, is, that is a high level orthodontic program out in Mesa. They don't have an orthodontic program in uh, at Midwestern, but they teach the basics of orthodontics. I, I employ a general dentist in my orthodontic practice to do some of the work that I don't have to do because she can do. And she was taught very well at, at Midwestern uh, on occlusion and aesthetics and follows directions. And um, years ago, we, we employed a hygienist in our orthodontic practice in Tucson who did our D-bands and scanning for Invisalign and things that were legal. And uh, when, when I decided to venture into my, my second practice in Peoria, because now I'm, I'm partnered up with a uh, kid's dentist in Peoria, I didn't want to let the Scottsdale practice slow down, so I employ a general dentist. And she bans, you know, the, the first job of an orthodontist when an orthodontist is employed by another orthodontist is, okay, you're going to be banding second molars, and you're going to be taking off braces and getting the adhesive off. So that's the kind of stuff that uh, Dr. Van Dyke does in my practice, and she's very happy. She, she enjoys her day, and she's learning about aesthetics, and... Uh, that, that can even go farther. I mean, I, we, we've gone so far as to say, okay, when, when we have an hour booked for a patient to have their braces off, offer to do a cosmetic workup on the mom. Uh, you know, we do, you know, photos and x-rays and things, and uh, we can talk to the mom about uh, making their smile better. I, I've always been a big believer that every, and I'm sure you are too, every general dentist should have photos of every patient. Just because when you bring them back for the recall appointment, they get this look at their teeth they instantly see things that you just couldn't convey to them in a, in a verbal exam. Well, you know, when Dennis asks me if they think I, they should get a $140,000 CAD cam or $100,000 CBCT or $125,000 laser, I always tell them that the number one return on investment of any piece of dental technology is always the camera. Is a camera. And what they, and, when, and I, I see, I, I've got to see 
as many or more dental websites than any dentist in America. Because every time a dentist sends me an email, if he's got his website linked in there, I look at it. And the people that I podcast and read marketing agree with me that 50% of dental websites get an F. An F. Yeah. And then the next 40% get like a D or a C. And then you see that one guy who's usually gives it to the assistant, but they digital photography, their website shows all their own work. And what they don't realize is that the internet is so ubiquitous. Say someone wants to get veneers or bleaching or bonding or implants or whatever, and they go to your website and it's like just a mugshot of the dentist that says he was born in this town and that's it. And then they go to another website and there's like 20 before and after cases of, an in, of implants, yeah. overdentures or cosmetics or veneers. And, and you're seeing, when I was little, only the rich people could fly in airplanes or they work for the government or the Fortune 500. And with Southwest Airlines, these people are getting on airplanes in Wichita and flying to Oklahoma City or Kansas City or whatever. And I'm thinking, okay, you just left Wichita to go to Kansas City to have this guy do your implants and crowns or veneers or bleach and And there's like 10 studs that I know of in Wichita, but you go to their website, there's no evidence of any of their what work. I mean, if I mean, to nail photography, digital photography. What he just said, it's 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 treatment plan presentation, it's marketing on your website, it's everything. But this is demonstrating censored. I, I I like to go to some um, very uncensored things because um, I think extremism is a big part of the human condition. I mean, I see it with my in, in family. You know, my my two oldest sisters went straight into the nunnery. That's that's taking Catholic school. To an extremism, right? And you, and whereas the other sisters were, were moderates, you know? But I see these dentists making these extreme things like um, their orthodontist recommended extraction, so they won't refer to them ever again. That non extraction, they're extremists. I'm like, I, I understand that 30 years ago there was too much extraction. But to say that there's no indication for extraction, and I'm telling you, on the message boards, I mean, I I'm on dental down all day, every day. There's a ton of dentists that think that there's no reason for a child. Well, what would you tell that extremist who thinks that there's no reason to extract four by cuspids ever, period? Well, is he right or is he wrong? He's getting closer to where I am. I mean, I mean if, if I look back and I don't want to come across as a non-extraction orthodontist, but if you, if you become aware of the four factors that I talked about, tooth eruption, skeletal, uh, airway, and um, the, the, the joint, and you, you, you blend into it proper breathing, absence of habits, and development of the jaws, you'll find that you can treat an awful lot more patients without removing teeth than you could in the past. I want a percent for the United States. Uh, Mac, Jim McNamara, who is older than I am, who I started my career with back in the 80s, uh, says that he probably removes four buys in less than 10% of his patients. Okay. And, so, that, and, that, and that's on a slide that he presents in his lectures on managing early treatment. I'll have to give... I, I but is that less than 10% of people who were properly managed from six, seven years old all the way up? Yeah. I mean, or is that 10% of just people who just show up at your door for the first time? Well, I, I think Jim, Jim McNamara is a, is a professor emeritus in, in Michigan, and he has the luxury of being able to see all kinds of young children at the proper time. Uh, the ADA says that you're supposed to see your kid's dentist at age two, you're supposed to see your orthodontist at age seven. So let's just, let's, let's talk in a perfect world and say, if I get to see a kid at age seven and do everything I'm taught to do and wish to do, and the parents can do to that kid, probably 10% or less where you need to take so that, that's where I just want to, I help, I got him, I got him to stand in the fire pit. Um, dude, when you say never extractions ever, it's a minimum of 10%. Now granted, when I was growing up, there were dentists there were orthodontists who did it on everyone. Well, yeah, and, 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 so, and, you, and you so have to understand. Understand. but don't be an extreme. It's the same thing with amalgam. When you tell me that you're metal free, first of all, I just immediately think you're a freak. I mean, do you do you fly in metal free airplanes? Is your car metal? Oh, what what is metal the devil? I mean, what does that even mean, metal free? And um, and when you have the fastest growing population are, uh, is women over 100. Second is women 90 to 100. Third is women 80 to 90. 
And when they're going in there with full-blown dementia, and when they go into nursing homes, which about 4.5% of Americans end up in a nursing home, um, and they're getting a root surface cavity one month, one per month is their average, and they take them into a dentist, and they don't, this, this lady doesn't even know the name of her children, doesn't know where she's at, doesn't know who she is, and you fix five root surface cavities with an inert plastic composite, when every geriatric dentist I talk to says that won't even last six months. And if you put an amalgam in there, or at least a glass onomer, an, an amalgam could, could last years. And, and you say, well, you don't, um, you know, you don't have amalgam. You're, you're, you're telling me that you got 2,000 patients and you never saw one, one instant for an amalgam when it's a little Johnny, he, he, he doesn't brush, he doesn't floss, he's worn the same U of A shirt three days in a row. And, you, and he's got a little occlusal pit, you put a little occlusal amalgam there, it'll probably average 38 years. And you put a complete occlusal composite there, it'll last six years. And you say, and your answer as a doctor of dental surgery is that you're metal free? You're not metal free, you're a freak. Yeah. That's what you are, you're, a, you're an extremist freak. So the, the extraction, you know, if you don't have amalgam in your office, um, this is probably the last episode of my show you'll ever watch because I just called him a freak. Uh, but the b b bottom line is there, there's, um, there's a lot of extremism. I, 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 I want to talk about one other extremist issue. There are many, many dentists who have told me over the last 30 years out there in the field lecturing that they're in a small town in, say, Redneck, Texas. Say they're, say they're in Edna, Texas, um, um, or Beeville, Texas. And he says, if I did an Invisalign case, I mean, I'm in a small town. There's only like 10 of us dentists. Yeah. One or if I did an Invisalign case... That dentist, he, the orthodontist, he'd never even talk to me again. And we go um, hog hunting and we go red fishing. Yeah. And, and um, there's just a lot of dentists who feel, but, but I never see that with the endodontist. I, I've never met a oral surgeon and said, well, if you pull a tooth, I'm not your friend. Or if you do a root canal, you know, don't call me and you're an endodontist. So you're, so you're saying that the orthodontist will never refer a patient to the general dentist if he does in business? He patient. won't be his friend anymore. Yeah. He won't be his friend. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. And, I actually, I'll, I'll and, and, and and they and I know one guy just recently. Just, I was in Texas for a week. Well, I don't want to get give too many clues away or yeah. figure out. And he was doing a Invisalign case, and so she went to the orthodontist because she was having trouble with one. And he said to her, you know, if you want to learn ortho, go to ortho school, and turn around and walk away. Wouldn't he even talk to her about this case. It's, but but she says, and we agree, if she had that problem with a root canal, went to an endodontist or an extract, you know what I mean? The right. other specialist would have said, you're a sovereign colleague, let's talk. And she got basically the door shut in her face. My absolute best, ref and I don't have, in Scottsdale, everybody's a super dentist. Okay, so they all, <laughs> they all do implants, kids, impl you know, Invisalign, braces, everything. So, but, but my absolute best referring dentist in, in Scottsdale does probably more Invisalign than any of my other referring dentists do. And I know it, he knows it, he refers, he, the ones that he refers to me are the ones we talked about earlier on the, in the podcast. Can you do anything with Invisalign? I said, we can do pretty much everything with Invisalign. Uh, but he's, a, he's an all-star cosmetic dentist who does, uh, he, he believes in myofunctional therapy, he understands the concept of growth, development, he's a non-extractionist. Um, he does phenomenal, I mean, he did my teeth. I mean, he, he, he does phenomenal work. And uh, he's, he's, he's a highly educated dentist. And, and if you and, and if an orthodontist has the luxury of being able to work with highly educated dentists, uh, both prosper. Well, you just, you just walked into the uh, most controversial, myofunctional therapy. I mean, whenever anybody says they believe in myofunctional therapy on dental town or ortho, I mean, I, I asked on, on this podcast, oh, I, know. I asked, I've done, you're probably, I've probably done 25 of the greatest orthodontists ever. And, um, every single one, I, I said, oh, every single one of them said, what, what percent of orthodontists believe in myofunctional therapy? And they'll, they'll just blame and say, none of them. It's quacker. It's whack. I mean, this is what they're saying. These are some of the most famous orthodontists in the world saying total quackery. But so to so walk into that one, myofunctional therapy. First of all, yeah, if you, you confirmed, you've confirmed the controversy of it. I confirmed the controversy. I confirmed the fact that it's very difficult to put your finger on the exact specialty itself. It really doesn't have an official licensing board. 
uh, that most of the myofunctional therapists that I've met are, uh, I, I, I'll say this jokingly and lovingly, but it, it's kind of, a, they're frustrated dental hygienists that are, that are looking for something else to do and they decided that uh, they're, they're gonna branch in, into that group. They're, they're very professional. Um, First, explain what it is. There's probably a lot well, of well, myofunctional therapy is, is mu muscle function therapy. Uh, when I when I alluded to James McNamara starting my profession back in the '80s, he was uh, treating people with functional orthodontic appliances, which is basically myofunctional therapy for orthodontists. Uh, I don't believe that myofunctional therapy can solve every problem, but I think everybody has to be aware of it. And I think if you, uh, like I said, if you follow my four tenets. Eruption of the teeth, jaw balance, joint function. The last one is airway and muscle function. And airway and muscle function has to be normal. Uh, I think a lot of uh, myofunctional therapy needs are because of bad airway. A lot of bad airway is being solved now with expansion, phase one treatment, which of course is controversial also. If you follow the orthotom message board or read the column that I write, I'll talk about how uh, early orthodontic care is becoming um, more of a norm and I'm accused of being in it for the money and you know darn well you can straighten people's teeth if you in 14 months if you wait till they all come in crooked and I'll say I agree but you haven't done the patient a service if, if I look back at my 30 years of finished cases and they're like 20,000 or so of them 20,000 yeah my business partner and I, yeah that's pretty good right I mean, yeah so, <laughs> wow uh, if, if I look back at my finished cases they look nice and I got my boards and I put my plaster on the table, which is what you're supposed to do. I don't think I have enough ex lateral expansion in my cases. And I, and, I, and I think you need lateral expansion to solve a lot of problems better. How many orthodontists do you think are in the United States? Under 15,000 or less. How, how many do we mail Orthotown Magazine to each other? I thought it was something like that. Right? Okay, 15,000. Yeah. Okay, so let's say 15,000 orthodontists each did 20,000 cases like you, which you've been doing it for three decades, I haven't. Um, gosh. So uh, you, you uh, have another meeting, and I'll get you for a couple more minutes, and I still got... Um, I'll come back. It was I'm, fun. I, I want to I wanna, <laughs> I'm gonna go into the other. Um, as a, you know, I, I, I try to be a journalist. I mean, I've, I've had a monthly column since yeah. 1994. I mean, I'm a dentist, but I, I try to be a journalist. And I think journalists look for clues, and the clues usually pop up in the controversy. That's why I call this Dentistry Uncensored. I don't want to talk about anything everyone agrees on. But the most controversial thing on Dental Town, and we started it, I'm 100% Irish, we started it on St. Patrick's Day. We got the idea in 98, and we got it up and running on March 17th, 1999. So we're coming up on our 20 year anniversary. Uh, and um, is occlusion. I mean, my God, they don't have these big wars on bond. I mean, occlusion, and the only way thing I can summarize it is world religion. Like my sisters, do you think I could build an online dental course and change my oldest sister, Catholic nun, to a Hindu or a Buddhist or Judaism? I mean, I, I couldn't even convert her to a Lutheran. And I'm not really sure. I mean, the difference between a Lutheran and a Catholic, you almost have to be an attorney. Right. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, yeah. it's Mother Mary. And, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know. I'm smart enough to describe the difference in a Catholic. But I, I know I could not convert her to a Lutheran. And to me, the occlusal camps are the same. First of all, do you confirm that that is the I, most... I, I will confirm that I started my career in dentistry during the occlusal wars. Yeah, occlusal uh, wars. Uh, I mean, the, they don't have impression I mean, there, wars. There, 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 Are there, there wars? You know, back, back, wars? Back then there was, you know, Panky Man, and, and mm -hmm. uh, we had Ron Roth in orthodontics, and then there was the argument, are articulators worthwhile or not worthwhile? Uh, I lecture down at ET still, and I bring my articulator, and they look at me like I'm crazy. Uh, face bows and all that kind of stuff. I think I think occlusion is 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 important. I think that it's uh, it's influenced by myofunctional issues. I think that people that have horrendous bites get by because they they made muscular um, compromises or uh, what? Yeah, I guess it'd be muscular compromises. So a patient with an open bite. Uh, sticks their tongue between their teeth or maybe sticking their tongue between their teeth cause the open bite I don't know, but that patient will do fine 
uh, when, when they bite down, you'll see wear on the back teeth and the dentist gets up, worked up and says, oh my God, you're wearing down your teeth. Well, we, perhaps the jaw joint is dissolving, causing the back teeth to hit harder. So now they're wearing down their teeth because of the jaw joint dissolving. I mean, you know, it, it's just multifactorial. And, and I've, uh, you know, when a, when a young dentist comes out within the first five years, they see one of each of these little problems and they, you know, they, they go crazy because they, they say, oh, we, we can't have this. You know, well, take a look and you'll see that this patient has perhaps lived with this for a long time or they've made uh, compensatory function a, a, arrangements for it. And it's kind of like my father, you know, who goes to the dentist at age, you know, 75 and he's told he has six cavities that have to be done instantly when he hasn't had anything done for 25 years. And, and you kind of went, well, you know, his, his immune response is pretty good or it's working or whatever. Uh, but I mean, I, I do believe in, in, a, in a stable position from which to diagnose. I mean, my, my first life was a prosthodontist. So, I mean, I went through steward articulators and DNARs and Hanau's and all this kind of stuff and did full mouth reconstructions with um, uh, all gothic arch tracings. You, 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 know all, you know all the lingo and I remember it, but I don't know how to do it anymore. Uh, I don't think... Why did you not say as a prosthodontist? Why, why did you need your journey to I think I, I think you can probably tell I'm a little more animated and a kid at heart. And I just kind of, I, I think that the prosthodontic practice back then, there wasn't a lot of delegation. So it was... 100% hands-on. In other words, I would have patients for, you know, four, five, six hours, you know, bring a lunch, you know, and, uh, and that's just, uh, my attention span is too short. So uh, I met another dual trained, uh, you know, Chuck Bull was another dual trained prosthodontist slash uh, orthodontist in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He encouraged me to go back to ortho school. I was teaching at the time and I got free tuition. And, and you were teaching at Mark Happy? Yeah. That was back when it was a Jesuit school. It's still a Jesuit school. Well, but um, do you remember the story with Reddy Schauner of Lord's Dental Studio? No. It was a Jesuit school, but they decided through budgetary deals they were going to close it down. Yeah. And the biggest lab in Wisconsin was Lord's Dental Studio. And okay. And at the time, the CEO was Reddy Schauner. He's like, what, what do you mean? You can't close this yeah. school down. And they go, no, we're, it's losing money for too many years to close it down. So he, arranged, he, so he got the state right. and the Jesuits to sit down. So it's the only... Half Jesuit, half kind of government. Like subsidized government. Yeah, yeah right. and, and Renny Schoner saved that entire yeah. school. And um, so for all you right-wingers who think everything should be free enterprise, there's a class example of that school. You know, I think the most functional governments when the government and the private sector work together. Well, I have, each other's I have nothing but great things to say about Marquette. I mean, they yeah. launched my career as a prosthodontist. I got tuition, went back to school, and yeah. you know, Rick Cushman was my lab partner. Rick Kushner. Rick Kushner was my lab uh, part of, uh, of Comfort, Comfort Dental. Dental. And he donated a million, a million dollars. A million dollars. And, a, and, a, and after graduation, I told Rick, I said, well, you can go to Colorado. You'll never make any money in that blue sky state. And he still digs me. So he, he was your lab partner? Yeah. To tell Rick to come on the show. He lives in, he's got the, know, he's got he, he's got the most Mountain. expensive home in Cape Creek, right? Yeah, some, uh, Desert Mountain or something. Desert Mountain. Yeah, it was yeah. in the newspaper. It was the most, mm -hmm. I think for when he bought it two or three years ago, it was the yeah. number one. And he gave a million dollars to Marquette. And, um, and I told him he'd never make a living. <laughs> and we've been best friends forever. And he will come with that. For some, I don't know if yeah. it's the format or, I, I think he told me that uh, he's not coming on the show because, uh, uh, I don't know. But anyway, uh, he should come on but, the show. But yeah, Rick and I sat right next to each other in, in uh, dental yeah. market. Yeah, what a hell of a man. Yeah. Um, and he's controversial. I think I think he and Aspen are controversial because they focused on the poor. The Medicaid, the Medicare. The, the, the well, you know. I, and I think what Rick also um, brings to light is that the time to do something disruptive is when you don't have to. You know, back, back in the days when, when Rick decided to drop fees... And, and treat the, the the underserved. He didn't have to do that because you could go out in the 80s and 90s and make a damn good living without doing that. But he said, you know, we can really change the world by doing this, just like Uber, just like uh, Smile Direct Club. I mean, so disruptive technology always comes from outside the industry, you know, and I think Rick really disrupted the industry. And that's why, and dentistry has a long history of elitism. And that's what mm -hmm. Rick and I really agree on the most. That's our blood connection. Is yeah. that we both? When you grew up in Kansas, 
I mean, it's, it's hard to be an elitist, yeah. you know, when all your... I mean, you know where I was when I was little? Both of my grandmothers still had, in Parks, Kansas had an outhouse. Well, they I still had an outhouse. I grew up on the south side of Milwaukee. And when, when With I, Laverne and Shirley? Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, pretty much. And when, and when I meet people in this neck of the woods or in Phoenix, I mean, and I meet someone from Milwaukee, it's never from my book. It's always from the upper, you know, north side or whatever. And say, oh, really? You know, and um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I have um, roots, you know. <laughs> yeah. In fact, my dad's biggest, uh, well, I won't go to that, but he, uh, he was smoking in the outhouse one time and blew it up. I mean, it really is a, <laughs> yeah. a methane gas, yeah. flammable gas, which he did not know about. Um, last question, because you got to run, 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 run. Um, one of the bizarrest things that I keep reading about it, um, it's coming from the anthropologist, not the orthodontist. But you keep seeing articles, and I keep posting them on Dental Town under the orthodontist section where anthropologists are saying, we don't see all these malocclusions going back the last month. They just popped up out of nowhere, and they're widespread. And I'm looking at that thing, and, and you know, Phoenix ASU um, has Lucy, the oldest hominid fossil ever found, okay. 1.6 million years old. I think she's. 40 inches long, 17 years old, still didn't have her third molars in. And when you start talking to an anthropologist, uh, now they're starting to ask orthodontists, do you realize that, you know, you go back just a few hundred years and it just pretty much disappears. So that makes you realize it had to be a change in the diet, um, habits, habits breathing, pacifiers, allergies, allergies all, that stuff. Sure, all that stuff. So, do you see the orthodontic community like 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 you talked about Parker's um, here at AT still? Do you think the orthodontic community is going to try to do a deep dive into finding out why do all the Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons and Denisovans not have it and we all do? Well, it seems like the advances in the research in orthodontics is always just like it is in medicine on treating the problem rather than, than looking for the, 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 the source. Uh, Sean Carlson's ortho science project is looking back at treatment. I don't know that we're really going back to look at the cause. I, it, I think it supports my interest in myofunctional therapy, understanding that proper breathing, airway, width of the maxilla, all these kind of things are very important. So uh, I think, not that, I'm a, not that I'm a leader in the field, but at least I've latched on to that part of, of treatment. I write about it in Orthotown, and I think that we start, we, we have to start looking at that. Well, we'll end on that because I, I to me, it's massive oh, yeah. But imagine the last two million years, that's about how old our species is, two million years, that little kid would have been chewing on meat on a bone right. and meat. And, and now, um, um, you know, they breastfed for years. And now the, the minute the child has just a little problem breastfeeding, you switch them to a bottle, which is gunk, gunk, gunk. So they're not developing yeah. the muscles. Um, they're not chewing on, a, um, on plants. And you also be and amazed at how many young kids that come in, for, and we're real big on referring for lingual freedom removal. And I can't tell you how many kids come in with narrow maxillas and protrusion have are tongue tied, and we're having our, our pedodontist friends and, and other uh, lactation specialists uh, cut the lingual freedom to help get the tongue to the roof of the mouth, develop the maxilla, things like that. And and he mentioned uh, Dan mentioned allergies a couple of times. That's another thing they're finding out that the that the asthma and allergy problems are massively more in the twenty richest countries. Yes. Than in the fifty poorest countries because. The immune system needs to be developed. You need to be crawling around in the dirt and getting dirty. Right. Now we're boiling bottles and hand wipes, and this kid never gets exposed to an allergen, and then you want to know why he has all these allergies and all these problems. And I used to, I, I've sent many of these to my mom, and uh, it's so funny. I say, I tease her so much. I say, thanks for not being a good cleaner, because uh, uh, none of your kids have right. all these allergies. We grew up in Kansas. I mean, you, you would you would just play on the back door. We all had a garden. No one, you didn't have to take your shoes off when you come inside. And and by having a that type of lifestyle, your immune system gets developed. And and there was just another article on it um, this Sunday again saying um, kids need to be exposed to a lot more allergens at a real early age, and that doesn't coincide with hand wipes and cleaning everything and yes, I, disinfecting. I probably agree with that. Yeah. So, uh, gosh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah. All right. Happy four-year anniversary to Dan Grover. Thank you.